Yeah, I am pleased, though, that we're having these sorts of discussions finally back in politics and it's not just uh, the low-rent sort of personal stuff. Um, there was a report out today, I read it, and I tell you, there was one thing in it that shocked me. Not that we've got this so-called all-time housing crisis and affordability crisis, cost of living out of control, we know all of that. This is the housing affordability report. It says on average, though, that households are spending around 48%, so almost half of their income, on mortgage repayments. That's what shocked me. That's the average mm. sort of component people are paying out from what they've got coming into the home. Renters have had an increase of nearly 24%. Vacancy rates sit below 1%. Uh, we know those issues are there for renters, but I tell you, how on earth do you survive, Andrew, if half your income goes out the door in a mortgage? And then secondly, for the government, this is a challenge to the Treasurer, how do you deal with that sort of mortgage stress in the budget in a way that's actually meaningful because I don't think there could be a handout that's going to touch the sides there. No, I don't think there is either. And um, I did have a cabinet minister suggest to me the problem in Sydney with house prices is unsolvable. Uh, you've got an area like Mount Jewett, which was hardly uh, an, an area people were rushing to uh, in recent years, where the median house price is 950000 You've got Paul Keating's Supposedly, Battler's area of Bankstown, the median house price is $1.2 million. I put this to the Treasurer in an interview on Sunday Agenda a few weeks ago. I didn't like the question. His suburb of Logan in Brisbane is mm. at five hundred grand. So uh, the, the, the statistic around 48% of a household budget doesn't surprise me when it concerns Sydney. What surprises is because for some years it's been between 35 and 50%, frankly. But nationally, is average, it is though, shocking. It? Nationally, it is shocking. And look, I, mean, I did a few door knocks with candidates in the state and federal elections. In the state election, after the rate hikes, a gentleman working from home, had, had, had babies there or whatever, was saying, yeah, just anything for a rate uh, to stop these rate hikes. Uh, you know, I bought this place a year ago and it's gone up so much. So the rate cuts are critical politically for the government, but also just plain economically, because... If, if the Michelle Bullock digs in and doesn't do them uh, by the end of the year, people are going to go bust, unemployment's going to rise, business people are going to go out of business and we're going into a recession. So mm. uh, the Reserve Bank, can't, I, I know they've, they, they, they've got a cautious approach on in, inflation, but they, they can't really muck around here after the last GDP figures. It needs to occur sooner rather than later. I don't think anyone would begrudge them another monthly or even quarterly inflation figure to make sure. But after that, they have to move. Mm. Um, the cost of housing is going up. It's a significant contributor to inflation. And so it ends up becoming sort of this vicious circle um, <laughs> instead of... Because the, the Reserve Bank's pushing up... Uh, keeping rates high, which is pushing up rents, which mm. in itself pushes up inflation. Now that it's in the threes, they've got to take a good look at that, the Reserve Bank. And the other thing, which the opposition will tackle ahead of the election with a policy and say, we can do better than this on Labor, which comes into play with that shocking rental vacancy figure you showed, only 0.7%, it's shocking, is immigration. Mm. Mm. You know, there's no point letting five or 600,000 people in here a year if you haven't got the housing for them, you're just squeezing the people here. Yeah, yeah, let me just here. jump in there, though. You and I both know, you and I both know, they, they made a judgment call, right? Pump prime the economy with migrants because that means at least they don't slip into technical recession. But we're in a per well, recession. Well, they're not the only not federal government to do that, though, are they? I mean, Scott Morrison okay. as Treasurer they, was they, quite happy to do that. Sure, well. sure. But not to the quantum of three times what Morrison had. What we yeah. had last year was three times what Morrison had. It's three times the highest record that was under Rudd in 2009, right? So what they're doing here is pump priming the, 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 the economy, quite rightly, um, but it's tepid growth, Andrew. It is not strong productivity-driven growth. It is tepid growth. And once they start to pull back on migration, which they have to, punters are cranky, the cities are crowded, all the infrastructure is a bottleneck, they'll pull back that number and they risk going into next year's election year in a recession. I mean, that's how 
dicey it could be. So this is why it's a line ball call. Hey, just quickly before we go, I know, I know we're close on time. I want your take on this uh, word that was in the uh, Sydney Morning Herald in the Age today that Labor's looking at restricting the big money donations. Now, this would be huge if they did this. Uh, they're looking at legislation, capping the amount that could be spent per electorate. And we know this happens in some states in state elections, but things like uh, campaign activities of advertising, signage, all of that will get some public funding. There'll be an increase in what's currently available. It'll throw out people like, like Clive Palmer from election races. I think that's a good thing. It's likely to benefit, though, that the small guys, the Teals, the Independents, even the Greens, not a great thing in my view. It won't come in until after the next election. And I'm interested, are they going to hold back the unions as much as they might hold back the big major parties. What's your sense of it all? Well, uh, I knew you were going to ask me about this, so I did some checking. The changes would also apply to unions, but it would be a significant cap, not like what the states have. There would be caps in individual seats. You can imagine the Teals won't like that. It's about trying to stop Clive Palmer and Simon Holmes at court, particularly Palmer influencing elections. But Don Farrell's the minister in charge, special minister of state. I think he wants bipartisan support. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult. He wants support from as much of the parliament as he can get. That might be difficult. You might be better off with some other things he's looking at, like real-time disclosures of donations within seven days and perhaps just a cap at the very top end on, on the palmers of the world. Some of these other changes, they're just going to be harder to get through. And, look, they have been subject to High Court challenges before. Are you telling me Clyde Palmer's not going to go to the High Court on this in terms of the implied uh, freedom of political association in the Constitution? Uh, mm -hmm. That's where mm -hmm. this would head. Yep. So it's, it's a long... Uh, the story is broadly accurate in terms of what the government's trying to do, but we are a long way yep. from uh, this going through the Senate, becoming law and uh, coming into practice, Peter. Uh, just quickly, any sense on the timing? Would we see it in the coming months, at least in terms of sort of exposure draft? So he wanted to do it, uh, Farrell, before the end of last year. Obviously hasn't been able to negotiate successfully with the party, so you're probably looking at the tail end of this year if it does happen at all. Maybe so. I suspect right, some of it will definitely happen in the next few months, but it's whether you can get over the line on those bigger reforms. And he, uh, the, the view of the government is, is they need broad agreement on them. A little bit of a rumour out there today. Yeah, land a bit of the facts for us tonight. Andrew, thank you as always.